Hello, fellow readers. This is James Stevens from Exploring God's Library 2020, session 32 and 33, which is the Parsha. And that's a Torah portion in, uh, for this week, On the Mountain and in My Statutes. The date uh, um, is with the Word of God. So if you're new, you're more than welcome to join us on the journey as we read through God's Library, which is uh, revealed in his 66 books, written by men of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in this session, we'll look at the concept of Jubilee in the book of Leviticus, examine the question of Job, the wisest man in the East, who, answered, who asked the question, where does wisdom come from, and uh, gives an answer. We'll also look at the book of Proverbs and examine the marks of an honorable man who knows when to argue over an issue, and when it's just a sign of foolishness. We'll also look at the New Testament writings in the books of Timothy and Titus and answer what are the attributes of a leader worthy of double honor. But first, this is how the Bible program, uh, reading program works. It's quite simple. If you read straight through the assigned readings of each day, which takes about 20 minutes, uh, you'll be through the Bible in a year. And first we start with the scriptures, also known as the, the Old Testament, composed of 39 books. And the first five of those books are known in Hebrew as the Torah, uh, or in Greek as the Pentateuch, the five scrolls. Each day we begin by reading a portion from the Torah called a Parsha, a section of a biblical book, based upon a religious reading custom dating back to the 6th century BC during the Babylonian captivity. This discipline ensured that everyone would be on the same page while they're reading the words so they could talk to one another about select passages. And we'll then read a portion from the wisdom literature as we've been doing you know, each week uh, and right now from the book of Job. At other times we'll be reading from the historic books of the Old Testament such as Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings and 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, which uh, compose one long narrative over a thousand-year uh, period. Or we'll read from the minor prophets like Hosea, Joel, or Amos, who preach against corruption and idolatry of, of pleasure and reliance on prosperity instead of God. Or from the major prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah, who prophesied a judgment and hope. Then each week we'll read a psalm of the day, which is read. There are seven psalms that are read each week, the same psalms. It's kind of been a repetitive thing. Uh, and it, along with that, we'll read one of the 150 psalms. So we go through the psalms uh, uh, twice in one year. And then we'll read a proverb or two each day, so we'll get through the entire book of Proverbs over the year. But we'll do a very careful uh, study of Proverbs. And finally, we will read a chapter from one of the 27 books of the New Testament. Each Tuesday evening, we'll briefly review our readings, providing commentary that we discover during the week, drawn from various resources. And if you have any questions that arise in your readings, you can always uh, subscribe and I'd like you to subscribe to exploringgodslibrary.org and you can post your questions there on relevant passages because each day uh, Elizabeth will uh, be posting the, the assigned readings for that day. And so if um, you have a question, just post it right there and then uh, either I or um, one of our readers will answer those questions. Um, and then if you're online like today, um, you can always... Um, um, you know, um, let yeah, let us know. Just, you know, text questions, and we'll address them as we go. Well, let's start with an opening prayer. It's um, from the, the Word of God, and, and we'll um, just pray at this specific time for the specific season that we're in. O Lord, to us belong shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set 
before us by his servants or prophets. Yes, all Israel, and that can include us in America, Lord, or in Europe or in any other place on earth, we've transgressed your law and we've departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. And you have confirmed your words which you spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. It's being done even to this world, this present age. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before you, the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord, you have kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, Lord our God, you who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned and we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, we pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are reproach to all those around us. Now therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and for the Lord's sake, Cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, on your people. Lord, O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications, our prayers, before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, Forgive, O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Bless this evening, this day, this session, that um, we will cover those things that we've been reading and that we might be uh, encouraged in Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, as we continue our examination of the Old Testament books of Leviticus and Job, we begin with the question, why do we need the Old Testament? Walter Kaiser, the famous Old Testament scholar, reminds us that the most definitive statement from the New Testament on how the Old Testament was to be used and what roles it must play in the life of believers uh, is our memory verse for this week, something we've been uh, looking at and found on our readings. It's in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, in Paul's admonition to Timothy. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now recall that when the Apostle Paul was preaching to the Bereans and others, he, was, uh, he only had his testimony um, and the testimony of his time with Jesus and the Old Testament. And nothing had yet been canonized from the uh, New Testament, from those letters. Jesus himself quoted the Old Testament 78 times and referred to the Old Testament as the Scriptures, the Word of God, and the wisdom of God. The apostles quoted 209 times from the Old Testament and considered it as the oracle of God. While Old Testament books like Leviticus are the first book which Jewish children in, you know, normally read in the synagogue, uh, the modern church has pretty much sidestepped the studying of much of the Old Testament, and in particular Leviticus. But uh, it really neglects it at its own peril because it's, it's an amazing book, and it really sets the foundation for a lot of uh, what we call uh, Western jurisprudence or the, the laws in the court system. Um, so before we uh, discuss the concept of Jubilee, I wanted to briefly look at how the Bible is read in the Jewish community in this thing called the Haftorah. And uh, why is that important? Um, because 
uh, Jesus actually refers to this in, in uh, Luke 4, 16 through 21, because it was a custom that we, we know that uh, when, uh, well, I'll, I'll just go into you know, kind of what this is. I was reading about it earlier today. I think it's very helpful because uh, when we're reading the, the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, we're, we're, we're basically reading a very ancient document. And so to understand how it was read, um, how Jesus was reading it in the synagogues is going to be really important for our understanding. Um, in accordance with the uh, quote, in accordance with today's customs, the t- weekly Torah readings follow an annual cycle in which the five books of Moses are divided into portions. That's the Torah portion, the parsha whose number is roughly equivalent to the number of weeks in the year. Like this week, we have two Torah portions. Uh, sometimes the, the portions that we're going through in the scripture are a little bit shorter, and so they, they pull those two together. So you know, we would think, oh, there's 52 Torah portions in a year because that corresponds to the 52 weeks of the year, but there are actually more Torah portions. And then sometimes there's not a portion read during uh, like uh, some of the feasts, like Passover, which would be our Resurrection Week or the Passion Week. Um, okay, so the tradition is referred to as the Babylonian custom and has been ex- the accepted practice in Jewish communities throughout the world for hundreds of years. However, during the Talmudic period and for many years afterward, it was customary in Palestine and other countries, especially Egypt, to read the Torah in accordance with a cycle lasting approximately three and a half years. So it wasn't just you know, read in one year. Um, and, but uh, in line with this practice, the Torah was divided into sederim, whose number vastly exceeded the number of portions, which I talked about. At least one half Torah, and this is what we're talking about with Jesus when he's reading this, this uh, passage uh, in Luke 4, 16 through 21, he's actually reading a half Torah. It's a passage which complements the reading of the Torah portion. So, this was uh, selected uh, in accordance with that calendar to, to be read. Um, and then uh, it said, um, most of these half Torah from the lists emerged from the Cairo Geniza. I guess that must be the, uh, the way of reading from the Cairo um, Jewish community. It's, however, not only the only source of information we have on the half Torah being read because it's talked about in the Old Testament. And I'm going to read that passage right now in 4, 16 through 21. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, on Shabbat, and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And this is uh, from uh, Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 61, 1 through 2. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Uh, in the Reformation Study Bible, it uh, comments on this passage, and it says, This account is the oldest known report of the order of worship in a synagogue service. The service included the reading from the law and one from the prophets. Jesus, or the ruler of the synagogue, may have chosen Isaiah 61.1 and 58.6. So it's customary to stand for the reading as a mark of respect for God's word and then to sit for the sermon. The reading chosen shows a strong concern for the poor. And now the MacArthur Study Bible notes uh, were that this was the acceptable year of the Lord or the year of the Lord's favor. Some would say it's a year of jubilee, the Lord's jubilee. The passage Christ read was Isaiah 61, 1 through 2. But he stops in the middle of verse 2. So the rest of the verse prophesies judgment in the day of God's vengeance. 
And since that part of the verse pertains to a second advent, when he's coming back to judge in righteousness, he, he didn't read it. So he's just talking about what God was doing at that time of history when he was on earth in his first incarnation. So, um, so Jesus returns to his hometown, and so he's given this book, and he reads it. And, uh, and so when he's reading this sermon, uh, which he argues that in that reading, the verse was fulfilled in the ears of the congregation. So all those people in that room, they were, he was saying, you have heard this be fulfilled today. Now, this is kind of an interesting uh, note that I discovered about the, there's, a, there's actually a deliberate exclusion of this passage in the half Torah or the, the reading that complements the Parsha or the, the, the weekly reading. And, and um, I quote, A perusal of the list of half Torah read today reveals that the chapter that Jesus recited in the synagogue in Nazareth is not read on any of the days in the Jewish calendar on which a half Torah follows a Torah reading. That is, on none of the Sabbaths, nor any of the major holidays or fast days. So you think, oh, well, so is this true? That he's reading the half Torah? And, uh, and it also held true with all these, these different uh, Sabbaths during the year when the Shabbat coincides with uh, Rosh Hodesh, the first day of the month, or Hanukkah, one of the intermediate days of Passover or Sukkot. Um, the point is especially blatant with respect, this is from a, a Jewish uh, uh, a magazine, by the way, it says, the point is especially blatant with respect to the seven Sabbaths between Tish Bahav and Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. On each of them, half Torah are read from the chapters of the Constellation of the Book of Isaiah. Is this merely a coincidence? Apparently, Isaiah 61.1 is de deliberately not read in the synagogue, but it is difficult to determine when and where the decision was made to exclude it. The heads of Jewish communities who had some familiarity with Christian faith and literature preferred to refrain from reading the same chapter Jesus read in the synagogue in Nazareth, which he claimed corroborated his divine mission on earth. And they also skip over uh, Isaiah uh, uh, chapter 53. So when the customs concerning the fixed half Torah readings were formalized, the abhorrence felt towards this chapter remained and is reflected in its exclusion from the list of half Torah unused today. And it said the point is especially noteworthy, and I think it's really noteworthy that's being written in a Jewish uh, newspaper about this, because, I mean, obviously, they're, they're talking about this. Um, and I think that's very good. That's very healthy. Um, because it's kind of, they fear who this Jesus really is. And it says, the point is especially noteworthy given the fact that the chapters prece preceding and following that problematic passage, chapter 60, and the end of chapter 61 and chapter 62 and 63, respectively, are read each year in public as half Torah. That means the chapter before and the chapter after, but not that chapter. Okay, <clears throat> we're going to look into, we're going to look at um, uh, Gordon Winham and the book of Leviticus. And, and so I, that all was kind of as a background for Jubilee, because we're going to talk about Jubilee. And it's, we're talking about the Lord's Jubilee. But we're going to talk about what was meant by the Jubilee and the purpose of the Jubilee according to um, the book of Leviticus. And we're going to be reading from um, the New International Commentary on the Old Testament, and in particular the book of Leviticus commentary by Gordon J. Winham. And um, he uh, uh, does an excellent job in this area. So I'm going to read uh, page 317 and about the sabbatical and jubilee, jubilee years. So I'm going to ask Elizabeth if she can give me just five minutes. Um, and there's a lot more here, but we'll see what we can get through in five minutes. Uh, he said that uh, regarding the Jubilee, the main purpose of these laws is to prevent the utter ruin of debtors. In biblical times, a man who incurred a debt that he could not repay could be forced to sell off his land 
or even his personal freedom by becoming a slave. You know, I mean, we don't, today we don't have debtor's prisons, uh, but there were debtor's prisons and also you could you know, be sold into bondage or your, your daughter could be taken you know, by uh, uh, someone that you owed a debt to or your children or your entire family. And, uh, and a slave was a little bit different in the, the, the Jewish system because you would be an indentured servant. You would, you would uh, work for them for seven years to pay off that debt, and then at the end of seven years you would be freed. And if you really uh, became like a, a servant in that house and you really loved the people and they loved you and you felt like that was the best place for you to, to uh, stay, then you would uh, take your, your ear, I think it was your right ear or something, put, in, put it um, next to the door frame which is kind of identifying with the house, and they would pierce your ear. Like, you know, women get pierced ears? Well, they would pierce your ear, and then you would have um, a, uh, kind of a signature that you were part of that house. And you had done it will, uh, willfully, uh, willingly. Um, anyway, uh, when left unchecked, this process led to a great social division with a class of rich landowners exploiting a mass of landless serfs. You, you see problems in 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 um, in the world where um, you know people the rich bec- you you hear this this term all the time the rich become richer and the poor become poor right and and the um, uh, the issue is that people start exploiting you know others and they just become richer and richer well the sort of situation has arisen in many societies and even Israel was not immune to it despite this legislation standards of house building have led archaeologists to conclude that early Israel was a relatively egalitarian society, so, um, but that by the later monarchy period, the, uh, the gap between rich and poor had widened. The rich houses are bigger and better built and in a different quarter from that where the poor houses are huddled together. Now Isaiah denounced the, denounces it, and he says, those who join house to house who add field to field until there is no more room. And then that was Isaiah 5.8. And then Amos, the prophet, uh, who was a farmer who became was sent to the king, angrily decries those who sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes. Amos 2.6. Um, and it said, had the jubilee been observed, such unbridled exploitation of the poor would have been checked. And the jubilee is also... Uh, also very much part of the seven years, um, you know, the seven-year periods, um, the sabbatical years, um, you know, having, having your, your crops, is, you know, six years and then, you know, having, letting the land rest for a year. And, and, um, and so it's much about the land. In effect, he may only rent out his land or his labor for a maximum of 49 years. The rent is payable. Oh, it says, uh, Levit- Le- Leviticus 25 prohibits, I think it's 25, says, um, um, what was that scripture? Leviticus 25, 8 through 17, 8 through 17 said, you must count seven cycles of sabbatical years, that is, seven years, seven times, and the 49 days of the seven cycles of sabbatical years shall be for you a year, or the days of the seven cycles of sabbatical years shall be for you 49 years. Then you must sound the trumpet throughout your land on the 10th day of the seventh month, the day of atonement. That's uh, Yom Kippur. You must, and now this is, I know this is a lot of numbers. I mean, it's, but it's a very, it's a, it's a, very particular formula that God had established to really uh, have equity throughout the land. Um, and he was saying that um, uh, the 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. And, oh, you must sanctify the year of the 50th year and proclaim a release in the land. It is a jubilee for you. You must all return to your property and to your families. The 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow or reap what grows by itself and do not pick your unpruned vines because the jubilee shall be holy for you. You may eat of the produce of the open country. In this year of jubilee, each of you must return to your inheritance. 
If you sell something to your fellow citizen or buy something from your fellow citizen, do not exploit your brother. And, um, and he was saying something about um, the land must not be sold off permanently, for the land is mine, uh, for you are resident aliens and settlers with me. Okay, just a few more minutes on this, because it's, it's a very rich kind of uh, thought about this, what this jubilee does. And it says, um, thus about once in every man's lifetime, the slate was wiped clean. I was talking to an attorney the other day, um, a Christian, and he was saying that, do you know that the bankruptcy laws were actually uh, planned uh, accordance with the kind of the jubilee idea? Um, so about once in every man's lifetime, the slate was wiped clean. Everyone had a chance to make a fresh start. The rich had to part with the land and the slaves they had acquired in the previous 49 years while the poor recovered their land and freedom. Now, it was also very free, too. I mean, the fact is, is that if you had a walled city and you had a house that you owned in the city, and let's say you couldn't afford that house, uh, and someone came along and said, I want to buy your house, and so they owned it for you know, the seven years and you couldn't pay them back or they owned it for the 50 years and you couldn't uh, buy it back or your relatives, you know, uh, couldn't buy it back. Your fortunes had not changed, so to speak. You had remained kind of um, poor or, or, or the like. Um, uh, then uh, if you couldn't buy it back within a one-year prescribed period during that uh, period of time, then you could not buy it back at all. So that land became owned by that person or that family. So I mean it was it was it gave it gave them an opportunity to buy it back and and um and if they chose not to or they were unable to do it then that uh went to the other owner. Um but there was land outside uh outside which was uh not inside the walls, and that had to go back to the, that person or that family. He said, but as a social institution, the Jubilee year remained an ideal which was rarely, if ever, realized. I mean, we realize that man is, man is depraved. Um, you know, the heart of man is corrupt, uh, that he was born in sin, and that, um, you know, it said that um, it didn't really happen that, that often. But when you didn't, you, when you failed to keep that, that uh, sabbatical kind of calendar in that, those ways, then God basically judged the nation. So he took them out of, out of Jerusalem for 70 years while the land had its rest. Evidence from Mesopotamia indicates that in old Babylonian times, 19th and 17th centuries BC, some kings did make administrative decrees whose effects were similar to the Jubilee laws. And it has been suggested that the Jubilee was the invention in Nehemiah's day, but North, this uh, one uh, theologian, made a strong case for supporting the followers, uh, a strong case for supposing that the followers of Moses were more likely to have embraced such idealism than the dispirited men who returned from exile. So, talking about the Sabbath of the land, See if there's anything else. Just um, one thing I want to catch here. Um, the theological principle underlying the Jubilee is enunciated. The land must not be sold off permanently, for the land is mine. Every tribe and every family within each tribe is allotted a portion of the land by divine decree. Numbers 32 and Joshua 13. And by insisting that the land could not be alienated from the family to whom God had assigned it. So this law aims to preserve the idea that the land ultimately belongs to God. His people are but resident aliens and settlers in the land. Uh, and in other words, it does not really belong to them. They inhabit it thanks solely to the mercy and favor of their God, the great land owner. Okay. So... Um, anyway, it's, it's, there's a lot of other issues that uh, kind of go into this. Um, and I'll just uh, close this one section with this. In Leviticus 25, it's talking about social justice. 
It says, the Jubilee was intended to prevent the accumulation of the wealth of the nation in the hands of a very few. Every Israelite had an inalienable right to his family land and to his freedom. If he lost them through falling into debt, he recovered them in the Jubilee. The biblical law is opposed equally to the monopolistic tendencies of unbridled capitalism and also thoroughgoing communism. So it's like both sides. In the extreme of capitalism, you have free enterprise. You know, we just exploit you know people, etc., um, with no um, kind of no concern for the poor and and for uh, the equity in society. Um, you know, where people are making you know you know I'm like today you know. I mean, $100 million and, and more, and then you people are working for peanuts. Or for thoroughgoing communism, where all property is in this, uh, the hands of the state, like you know, in socialist countries or communist countries like Russia and China. And um, so they wanted to strike that, that particular balance. By keeping land within a particular family, the Jubilee also promoted family unity. And I think there are there were laws, um, you know, where they had uh, uh, people were talking about like family trust, uh, which actually protect land. Like you might have a family that you know somebody is very uh, wise with their money and um, or maybe you know very blessed. Uh, they, they could be a ministry, and you know it's it they're that's not their calling, so they're not making a lot of money. But there could be people that are in that are in business that that um, you know give to the family and you know raise up. You know, um, you know, build quite a large, large estate, and so when they give over that, they put it in trust, so that if there are people that are maybe less, um, they aren't as uh, good stewards with their money, that uh, they can't sell the, you know, the money or sell the land, uh, and pay off a gambling debt or a bad business venture or, or get taken advantage of by other people. Maybe they aren't that, you know, that wise. And so there are instruments that have been developed to you know, protect the land. And I think you know, this is also an instrument where God you know, looks at um, the stability of a society. And you can see the, the problems that we have in our own country with so much debt. Okay, well, I'm going to stop there on that. Now let's go to, um, we're going to now look at the book of Job. Uh, how righteous was Job? Um, there is a, a scripture passage, and it says, I didn't put down the, the passage on that. I forgot. I have to write that down. <clears throat> it says, I think it was in James, in the, uh, Job was talked about because he's a real person. And he said, if I send a plague into that land where you live and pour out my wrath on it through bloodshed, killing its people and their animals. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they could not save, they could save neither son nor daughter. They would save only themselves by their righteousness. And so this is looking at that, that um, you know, looking at the grace of God. And it's also looking at the, the amazing wisdom of these godly wisdom of people like Noah and Daniel. I mean, Daniel was an incredibly wise man, as were, as were you know, Joseph and Nehemiah, etc. And, um, and so it's talking about his righteousness. So when Job is, <coughs> when Job is asked a question, it's like, you know, what is wisdom? You know, we're kind of looking at uh, uh, the uh, coming into the Job's discourse on wisdom in chapter 28, which is quite interesting. But this week we've, we've been reading, as you've been reading along, we're reading about the discourse between Job and two of his friends, Eliphaz and Bildad, and also Elihu. Uh, and uh, Dr. John MacArthur outlines this as the third cycle in this kind of um, this courtroom trial. First is Eliphaz's third speech, where he denounces Job's criticism of God's justice. And when we read some of those things, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's really quite disturbing, uh, you know, when you're reading and you start to understand this. I mean, I used to read through Job, and I, I, 
I just read through it so fast. I mean, it was like it's kind of tedious, you know, reading. But then you start realizing that um, you know, oftentimes you think that people are very wise and they're giving you counsel, but their counsel is really it might have a lot of flowery sounding things. You know, very you know, sounds like you know, very godly, but a lot of times they are they are you know, they're it's worthless counsel. And this is an example of some of those things. And um, uh, we were reading in, let's see if I'm 13, okay, good. Uh, we're reading in Job 25 uh, where uh, Bildad is saying, how can man be righteous? You know, and, um, you know, he's, how, how can, how can uh, he be at peace who is born of a woman? How much land, uh, less a man who is, um, I can't read my writing, I should have, I'm, I'm writing the scriptures, which is really helpful, but sometimes you're writing a lot and you can't read it all very carefully. Uh, but then he, uh, Job answers him and he's talking about man's frailty and God's majesty. And, um, and then he's talking about, uh, um, he, he, he's hanging the earth on nothing and he drew a circle on the horizon in the face of the water uh, the boundary of light and darkness. So he's really talking about, you know, the majesty of God, and then, then he's, uh, uh, he, you know, continues in his discourse, and, and, uh, and then, then he, uh, he gives his summary defense, in Job, uh, I think in, Job twenty nine thirty. But let's go look at um, Job. We're going to look at Job twenty eight. And, and what we're tra- attempting to understand here is really the difference between wisdom and knowledge. And Elizabeth, could you turn the heat down a little bit? It's been a chilly day out here. It rained yesterday. And, um, I was listening to a, a talk by uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones on Job 28, and I, I would recommend that. If you go there, he'll, he'll go and he'll really take takes apart the issue of what's the difference between wisdom and knowledge. He said, we have a lot of knowledge in this world, and uh, people are, are just, you know, I mean, they, they know a lot, of, a lot of facts, a lot of figures, um, but at the same time, it's how to take those and apply them to our, our daily life. And, and he was uh, mentioning that many times uh, as a doctor in England, uh, he's working with royalty, um, <coughs> he would come, he would meet people that are extremely brilliant, but they were not practicing it in their home. Uh, they weren't taking care of their wives. They weren't taking care of their children. Um, they may, may have known a lot about um, uh, you know, certain aspects of economics, but... Um, they were, you know, maybe sometimes just really terrible fathers. And so uh, he, he goes into this whole issue of, you know, what is, what is um, wisdom. But what Job says, he says, Surely there is a mine for silver, Job, in chapter 28. Surely there is a mine for silver in a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is smelted from ore. Man puts an end to darkness and searches every recess. For ore in the darkness and the shadow of death. He breaks open a shaft away from the people and places forgotten by feet. They hang far away from men. They swing to and fro. As for the earth, from it comes bread, but underneath it is turned up by fire. Its stones are the source of sapphires and it contains gold dust. That path no bird knows because the birds are flying over. It's, they're going underground. And the proud lions have not trodden over it, so they're underground. The, the fierce lions don't see it. And then the man puts his hand on the flint. He overturns the mountains at the roots. He cuts channels in the rock because he's trying to protect himself from flooding and from, uh, from you know, mines you know, uh, crushing him uh, for you know, cave-ins, etc. Uh, I mean, these are, this is a very old document in you know, it's it's amazing how uh, man was brilliant enough to actually look at the earth and figure out 
how to find silver and, and iron ore and all those things. I mean, these were these were you know these were not cavemen. These were you know men created in the image of God, like Adam. Were very brilliant, naming all the animals and and, and um, you know the, the fish of the sea, etc., and the plants. So, so they understood. Uh, they had a lot of knowledge about how to find things, and they spent a lot of time in in trying to acquire wealth. And and it says he sees every precious stream. He dams up the streams from trickling. What is hidden, he brings forth the light. Then, so he's talking about. Job is talking about man and his ingenuity in, in bringing forth these, these um, treasures from darkness. But then he asks the question, but where can wisdom be found? And where is a place of understanding? Man does not know its value, and nor is it found in the land of the living. So it's not, uh, it's not here. The deep says, it is not in me, and the sea says, it's not with me. It cannot be purchased for gold, nor can silver be weighed for its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, and precious onyx or sapphire, very beautiful stones. Neither gold nor crystal can equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewelry or fine gold. I mean, you can't buy, you can't go to God, God you know, go to God and say, okay, I'm going to, you know, sell me, some, sell, sell me some wisdom. Remember that one shaman or that that um, wizard uh, that wanted to buy you know the power of the Holy Spirit and uh, they're like you know cursed you know he curse you with that you know that's terrible uh, you, you you can't buy it from God it's a gift from God and uh, he bestows wisdom on to, who who asked for it or who who he decides to uh, give to like Solomon became the wisest man on earth um, and some people actually think that uh, that Solomon may have written a Job um, because he understood all these these issues. He was very wise. So he says, um, "So from where then does wisdom come, and where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living, and concealed from the birds of the air." Destruction and death say, we have heard a report about it with our ears. So, yeah, I don't know where it's at. Um, but God understands its way and knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees under the whole heavens. Remember, uh, he, uh, he, asked, he asked Solomon, he said, what do you want from me? And Solomon said, I need, I'm not very wise. I need wisdom to, to you know, to guide such a great nation and all these people. And so he, because he didn't ask for long life and you know, riches, etc., he gave him long life and riches, and he gave him so much, but he was really asking for wisdom. Because wisdom is, is, is the, uh, the, most, the most valuable thing we can get. So he says, God understands this way, and he knows this place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees under the whole heavens, to establish a weight for the wind and a portion of the waters by measure. When he made a law for the rain and a path for the thunderbolt, then he saw wisdom and declared it. He prepared it. Indeed, he searched it out. And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is the wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. So the fear of the Lord, that's wisdom. Okay, well, we could talk a lot more about that, but we're going to move into, how are we on time? 647. We're at 647. Okay, so we're going to look at Psalm uh, 30, 31. You may have read it this week, and, and what uh, might have uh, struck you is one of the verses sounds a lot like something Jesus said on the cross. It's Psalm 31.5. It says, Into your hand I commit my spirit. And the New Testament fulfillment of that is in Luke 23, 46. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his laugh. Well, he didn't breathe his last, laugh. He breathed his last. Breathed his last. Uh, Spurgeon's commentary on this is from the Treasury of David, which is uh, a book I highly recommend, you know, you know getting that. 
He says, into thy hand I commit my spirit. These living words of David were our Lord's dying words and have been frequently used by holy men in their hour of departure. Be assured that they are good, choice, wise, and solemn words. We may use them now and in the last tremendous hour. Observe the object of the good man's solicitude and life and death is not his body or his estate, but his spirit. This is his jewel, his secret treasure. If this be safe, all is well. See what he does with this, his pearl? He commits it to the hand of his God. It came from him. It is his own. He has after time mentioned it. He is able to keep it. And it is most fit that he should receive it. All things are safe in Yahweh's hands. What we entrust to the Lord will be secure. You know, Lay not your treasure up uh, on earth where thieves and Thieves can break and steal, or rust can, you know, take take uh, your things, or you know, you your your uh, food can get all moldy. You lose all those kind of things, or your clothes can get eaten by moths. But lay your treasure up in heaven, where rust and all those things can't corrupt it, and that thieves can't take them. He said, um, so all things are safe in in Yahweh's hands. What we entrust the Lord will be secure, both now and in the that. Um, that day of days towards which we are hastening. Without reservation, the good man yields himself to his heavenly Father's hand. It is enough for him to be there. It is peaceful, living, and glorious, dying to repose in the care of heaven. At all times, we should commit and continue to commit our our all to Jesus' sacred care. Then, though life may hang on a thread, and adversities may multiply as the sands of the sea, our soul shall dwell at ease and delight itself in quiet resting places. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Redemption is a solid base for confidence. David had known, not known Calvary as we have done, but temporal redemption cheered him. And shall not eternal redemption yet more sweetly console us? Past deliverances are strong pleas for present assistance. What the Lord has done, he will do again, for he changes not. He is a God of veracity, truth, and he is faithful to his promises and gracious to his saints, and he will not turn away from his people. And I think about this, the, the dying words of a man. Um, you know, you, um, today a great saint passed into eternity. Uh, Rabbi Zacharias, who you know, was a remarkable apologist that uh, touched the lives of millions and students and kings and and uh, you know, shahs and and mullahs and he, he talked to a lot of different people about the gospel and um, and he went to his reward today and you know he was even I remember when he was talking to Ben Shapiro um, uh, he was he was talking from his car or his his um, uh, yeah from his car in the uh, hospital parking lot before he's going in for his cancer uh, treatment, and so he died from a very rare form of cancer, uh, bone cancer, and he's now with the Lord. But you know he um, he committed his his life into the you know the hand of the Lord, and so he went to his reward, and that's uh, you know that's a great thing. Um, it's sad for it's sad for those he's left behind, and sad for us. You know, the great man has died. Um, you know, a lion of the faith who really uh, deserves a place, kind of like in the Hall of Heroes. I mean, Hebrews eleven. I mean, he he was a lion. I mean, he he wasn't afraid of very much, except he had a fear of the Lord, and loved the Lord. Um, okay, so we're now going to jump to. We have how many minutes? We have eight minutes. I'm going to jump to Proverbs uh, 20, uh, verse 3. It's an honorable, it, it is honorable for a man to stop striving, since any fool can start a quarrel. So I'm going to read just a little bit from Charles, uh, Charles Bridges, and um, it's quite interesting. He says uh, in his commentary on Proverbs, A world of sin must always be a world of strife, because governed by the wisdom that dis- descendeth not from above. Uh, it's, so if you have earthly wisdom, it's just, it's a 
the parent of strife, confusion, and every evil work. Um, I remember Rob Emanuel, who was an advisor to um, the former president, that uh, he said, um, never let a, a crisis, uh, let a crisis uh, go to waste. And that's really wisdom from below. It's taking advantage of the things that are happening. And it says, And yet an evil world is a fine theater for the display of the grace of God and the fruits of the wisdom that is from above, meekness and gentleness. We have been before reminded it is the glory of a man to pass over transgression and um, to cease from strife. And it says it's far more difficult to gather back the waters once left out in an argument than to restrain them within their proper bounds, to leave off contention, to stop an argument, especially when we see that we're in the wrong uh, or if we're in the right, that no good will come from it. That is a high honor for a man, a noble triumph over the flesh. And it's like that battle over the tongue, so important. And that battle over the tongue really begins as a battle in the heart, heart and mind. Um, Abraham thus ceased from strife by disinterested concession in Genesis 13, 8, and 9. And then um, it says... Um, A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. So to, to have that kind of mouth, because it's a, a fool can argue. Uh, he can start a quarrel. But it says, uh, a word from the Lord is the remembrance. Who made our mouth? Um, it really puts away pride, because we're thinking about you know, control of our tongue. The pain that every right-minded Christian feels in giving open rebuke is abundantly compensated by the joy of a happy issue, like an outcome. Even an unsuccessful effort brings a joy in the testimony of our conscience. It must, however, be a word spoken in due season, though it be from feeble lips. So sometimes, you know, we don't we don't come across right, and um, you know we, uh, but we're restraining ourselves and we're kind of thinking through what we're going to speak to others. So. That um, that's that's a word spoken in due season. It's like a, a it's like a um, a word that spoke. What was that? Uh, like settings of silver. A word. Settings of silver. A word aptly spoken is like uh, uh, settings of gold and uh, apples in a setting of silver or something like that. I can't. Remember. Do you remember what that is, Elena? No. no. I'm si- seeing Elena here. Um, <coughs> So we must return, wait for the return when we're, when we're irritated. Uh, and we're in a season of irritation. It's like that's not a, a word spoken in season. Uh, uh, it's like it's out of season if we're speaking right there. He said we must apples wait. Of of apples of golden settings of silver. We must wait for the return of calmness and reason. Sometimes, indeed, the matter forces itself out after lengthened and apparently ineffectual waiting. Uh, but this explosion uh, sweeps away every prospect of good if you're just exploding. Uh, Martin Luther said, The word of a brother pronounced from Holy Scripture in a time of need carries an inconceivable weight with it. The Holy Spirit accompanies it and by it moves and animates the hearts of the people as their circumstances require. Thus Timothy and Titus and Epaphroditus and the brethren who met St. Paul from Rome cheered his spirit, however much they might be inferior to him in learning and skill in the word of God. And it says the greatest of saints have, have their times of faintness when others are stronger than they. So uh, you don't know where that, that good word is going to come from. It may come from a, a brother that's not... Uh, that just has a lot of wisdom, and uh, maybe he's not, you know, as learned as you are, but he has wisdom. It's the difference between that knowledge, you know, that sometimes people lord knowledge over you, but it's also that, you know, that wise person who's been through a lot of trials and they have more wisdom, and so they're they're maybe more in control of their own, their own, um, their own temperament. 
because we don't want to be, we don't, we don't want, we, we want our words to be, he says, a fertilizing shower, not a violent and destructive tempest. Um, okay, well, I'm just I'm start stop there because we're almost out of time. What time are we at? We have two minutes. Okay. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about uh, the elders and the deacons, um, and I don't really have a lot of time, but I'd like to just uh, say that I believe we did post something on Second uh, Timothy uh, that Pastor John MacArthur talked about. Um, and it would be on exploringgodslibrary.org. Uh, we're attempting to post these videos that actually complement the study. So when you're studying uh, the, um, the, the passages in, in uh, Timothy, it would be very helpful. And um, also, uh, the church in the Bible, John Owen, uh, we have John Owen, we have the book of Leviticus and Numbers, which is coming up for the next commentary that we're going to be uh, studying Numbers. Uh, all these books are going to be uh, posted with links so you can, so it can show, show you where you can find them. But the reason why I'm referring to Church in the Bible, there's actually quite a good deal on this book. I mean, these are amazing um, uh, resources. I mean, for anybody's library that uh, really wants to understand these things. But there's a chapter 8, which is talking about the nature of the church or the duty of elders. And it's uh, probably about, I think it's, duty of elders is rule of elders, um, 106 to, to um, well, 149 includes the deacons. So he talks about a lot of the, uh, the deacons, et cetera, and the elders. And, um, but uh, I, I just recently heard a, a, a sermon, an old sermon, by uh, Pastor MacArthur on elders, which um, I'll make sure that we have it up there. Can we make sure we have that up there? Um, and we'll, we'll check on it. Uh, and if we don't have it up there, we'll make sure it's up there. But he really goes through and talks about how important it is to have elders. Because you're talking about the whole body working together. It's not all dependent on the, on the pastor. It's dependent upon the whole body of Christ working together. Deacons, deaconesses, elders, um, you know, elders that are teaching, teaching elders, administrative elders, people that have you know, certain uh, gift sets. And, um, and so... I think this area of elders is going to be important. Also, I, I read this week, um, what were you going to say? Oh, all right. I also, um, I was going to talk about this. I, I have so much more that I could be talking about. There's a book called Building Godly Nations, and it's Lessons from the Bible and America's Christian History by Stephen K. McDowell. I also put this up online. Um, and the reason why I did that is it's been on my heart this week because um, we, are, we are approaching the 400th anniversary of the pilgrimage or the pilgrims landing at um, well, Plymouth Rock. And, and it was on November 11th, 1620. And that was when the Mayflower Compact was was um, uh, written and signed by all the you know, different people that uh, were on that that ship, and these were from the persecuted. Well, they were Puritans that were persecuted and had fled to to um, to uh, Denmark, and then fled from Denmark to came to the United States. But uh, I think that the reason I've been thinking about this is that that. Um, it seems that sometimes we go through problems in history and we fail to recognize the time and the season we're in. And um, with such a great uh, attack um, and a great judgment, in a sense, like this coronavirus is coming on the world, it seems to me that, that uh, the enemy knows his ta- time is very short. And um, it's also important for us to remember the where we fell and what we've lost over the last 400 years and to 
be intentional about looking at reforming our lives and going back to the doctrines of the faith. And I think that's one of the things that, that um, you know, that was called for, you know, by, uh, uh, by the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 3. And he said, perilous times, perilous men. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. And I think that um, you know, he's, he's really uh, giving an exhortation and a warning you know, to us even these last days. The perilous times will come. And, and that um, we were to preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things and do the work of an evangelist. That's in Second Timothy 4. And, um, and, and then when he was talking about Titus, he was talking about those bishops, you know, those elders. And I think it's really important to, you know, to, uh, to look at this. I'm, we're still looking for our, we're getting a, um, a commentary on uh, Timothy and Titus. We're still putting together our commentaries. There's so many commentaries and, uh, for study. So I haven't got, got all the commentaries on, on those, but we're, we're ordering those. But um, in Titus 1, it says, A bishop must be blameless, a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered. So we're talking about these, these things in Proverbs, not quick-tempered. We're talking about stewardship. Nor given to wine, nor not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, um, noble-minded, a sober-minded, noble-minded too, uh, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast to the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able a by sound doctrine, both to exhort and uh, convict those who contradict. There's a lot of that going around. A lot of, lot of um, you know, uh, heresies. You know, people that I've known for years. You know, getting into different kind of doctrines that are really um, abhorrent to the, you know, the the Christian faith. But they're like, you know, heaping up these kind of doctrines. Oh. <laughs> Um, this is kind of a book book night. Um, we're trying to <coughs> get this these different books um, kind of uh, network people to the resources um, uh, at um, you can get these on like Amazon uh, dot com. We do have an affiliate marketing link, so uh, we don't ask for support. But one of the things we do is we get a small uh, compensation um, from anything that you buy, uh, like you know, these books that we recommend, and that kind of keeps keeps us funded. But um, this is R.K. Harrison's uh, book on numbers. That's a very good book, which will be uh, which will be good to uh, look at, especially we're starting to read uh, numbers quite soon because we're almost through Leviticus. But anyway, that's. Um, that's, thank you, Elizabeth, for bringing those things to my attention. I almost forgot about those. Um, there are a lot of uh, valuable helps out there, which I think that as we slowly build our libraries, um, you know, we're, we're really building a library for a lifetime of learning. So, I mean, it's, it's an intentional thing. I mean, what does it say? You know, by wisdom is a house built and fill, filled with all you know, precious treasures and riches. I mean, it's, it doesn't happen without some for for some um, you know, foresight and insight and wisdom. And you need that wisdom. Um, okay, so I just want to just remind people that are uh, reading through the Word that, you know, 
remember your purpose and goal. It's, you know, it's that we want to get to know the Lord more fully. And that's really a lot through the reading of his word. I mean, he wants to speak to us. He is speaking to us all the time. And he's specifically speaking to us through his letters, through his word. And, uh, and it says there are promises that are attached to that. It says he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. And in these days, he is our shelter. He's our rock. He's our provider. Um, and, and there's no doubt that um, you know, he will take care of his, his own. You know, in conclusion, you know, one of the former presidents, John Quincy Adams, told his son about reading the Bible. He said, it's my custom to read four or five chapters every morning immediately after rising from my bed. He's talking to his son, and you're instructing your son. It employs about an hour of my time and seems to me the most suitable manner of beginning the day. And I, I agree with him. It's undoubtedly the most important uh, appointment of our day uh, that we have. You know, coming to him in prayer and then reading his word and discussing his word. Well, let's close in Psalm uh, 23, is a psalm of David, and I think it's an appropriate psalm for our day. Thank you for coming and joining us. And remember, um, do, do subscribe to uh, exploringgodslibrary.org. It's free. Uh, that way you'll get uh, notifications each day of what we're posting you know, from YouTube videos that are supplementary to uh, the readings. You also get the readings every day, too, as well. So, let's pray. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leaves me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, we thank you for this brief time of study tonight. There's so much to cover, and and we pray that there were some things that are useful, and we pray that you would bless each of the people that that do watch this and bless their ministry, bless their walk with the Lord, bless their families, keep them safe uh, in this uncertain time. And, and Lord, um, and, and pour out your shalom, your peace, which surpasses all understanding on all of our hearts and minds. Give us good health, Lord, and, and help us to, to uh, finish well, to hear from you, well done, good and faithful servant, enter in the joy of our master. Thank you. In Yeshua's name, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, amen. Well, thanks for joining us tonight and uh, have a good week.